Welcome, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us here for the uh, XR Access and XR Association community discussion on captions. Uh, we are really excited to be here today, um, have you all joining us because the these discussions are really special because XR is even this many years into it, even after so many you know keynotes and conferences and things, it's still kind of the wild west when it comes to accessibility. And so these discussions are really important because there is no one expert that has a, a perfect understanding of exactly how to make all of this accessible. But between all of the experts that we have in this room, uh, I think if we join forces together and have a, a really great discussion here today, we should be able to uh, get a little bit closer uh, to figuring out what exactly those best practices are. Um, so we're joined here today uh, by Pierce Clark from the XR Association. Uh, I'm Dylan Fox. I'm the Director of Operations for XR Access. Uh, and we also have uh, our three guest speakers, uh, Brendan Gilbert, Yao Ding, and Lily Bond, uh, who each bring uh, their own expertise and are going to help us out uh, by kind of setting the stage um, by giving 10 minutes each on uh, how they have experienced captions uh, and, and their best practices so far. Um, so after the, they speak for 10 minutes piece, we're going to have a 60 minute period of just general discussion. Uh, and then afterwards, we will be uh, putting out both this conversation onto YouTube, uh, as well as a best practices document um, that kind of captures the lessons that we've learned today. Um, so that I'm going to pass it to Pierce. Great. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, good morning and afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the States. My name is Pierce Clark. I'm the program development manager at XRA. Uh, this is our third community discussion series that XRA and XR Access have partnered up to, to join. Our first one was held on audio cues. Uh, we held the second on haptics, and now we are very pleased to uh, hold everybody here for our closed captioning um, episode. Um, as Dylan mentioned, our outputs from all of this are going to be a recording on YouTube. We're also going to write a document kind of summarizing the conversation and uh, uh, post that to everybody. And um, hopefully everybody can uh, distribute those to their networks so we can kind of bubble up some of the main points um, to the wider network on how uh, closed captioning helps, what it can do, and what are some lessons learned um, um, coming out of this discussion. So we're very pleased to get started. Um, as far as kind of run of the show goes, Dylan and I are going to help navigate the chats. Um, we are going to introduce all of our speakers, and we're going to kind of quarterback the discussion afterwards. Uh, we're a really open and friendly group, so if you have any questions, then feel free to write them in the chat, and Dylan and I will kind of um, bring them up to the presenters if they're directed towards the presenters. But also feel free to, you know, put your camera on and uh, uh, ask, ask the question live. Um, the purpose of this is really to kind of network, uh, get some ideas floating around the, the group, and we invite uh, participation, of course. Um, and with all of that, I am very excited to introduce uh, Brendan Gilbert, who is going to be our first of three uh, speakers today. Uh, Brendan's an accessibility advocate, and for uh, the rest of his introduction, I um, would love to invite Brendan to take the reins. Um, Brendan. Okay, I'm just going to pause for a second to make sure all of the spotlighting is taken care of, make sure everybody can see who they need to see. Um, I'm not able to see my interpreter yet, so, okay, there we go. Now I see it, okay, great. Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Gilbert, and as Pierce said, I am an accessibility advocate. I push and encourage inclusion because I am a deaf person since birth. I've had unique challenges with communication barriers. And my first uh, experience with accessibility was at Meta. I worked there for four years uh, previously, and I dove into the AR, VR world and got really passionate about how that can meld with my deaf world and how I can immerse myself, but access them. I wasn't able to access them at that time. And so I really wanted to push for that accessibility so that I was able to use those things. Um, I work with VSL Labs. I'm the director of accessibility for them now. I'm supporting their 
um, work with a product of doing um, English to ASL work. And I'm excited to be here today to talk with you all and hopefully share some of my thoughts and brain power with you. Okay. And then are we going back to Pierce or Yao to introduce themselves or what's the plan now? That's perfect. Um, thanks so much, Brendan. Um, so we would love now to pass it over to uh, Yao next uh, to share some of the work that he's doing in the space. Well, just just to clarify, clarify uh, Brendan, did, I think we're, we're doing introductions and then straight into your, anything else you wanted to share uh, rather than doing a, a round robin of introductions first. So did you want to share anything else before we got into the main discussion? OK, yeah, I, I, I can go ahead and end my presentation or we can uh, go into introductions first. So I'm I'm good with introductions um, or whatever. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm getting back into my normal signing as well. So just let me know what the, the preference is, Dylan. Do we want to go to introductions? Oh, why don't you go ahead and and, and give your presentation and we'll have Yao introduce himself before his. Oh, OK. All right. And just one second for the interpreter. I'm going to, to switch to make sure that Brendan is first. One second. OK, got it. OK, and making sure everybody can see me. All right, well, hello again. I'm back. <laughs> that was very short lived. Uh, so I'm Bringing my thoughts, of my four year working at Meta, I tested the Quest products and I worked with um, immersive, I also worked with the immersive caption group. That's where I actually met a lot of the folks here, Dylan Fox and um, others in that group, because there's unique challenges in the 360 world. And how do we have captions available there? And then there's, um, you know, we're not, focusing on XR only here. So where well, this is focusing on XR, so I'm not gonna share my other captioning challenges that I work on. Um, I've got my notes on my other screen and it's not working now, it's up, okay. So today I'd like to share a lot about my deaf perspective. I've already mentioned that I was, I'm was i deaf since birth. I've experienced many communication barriers, including captionings, uh, captioning or sign language interpreters. Typically, people don't think about accessibility in the design process at the beginning. So that's something that I have to advocate for to get it included so that I'm able to access things. Uh, so that's where I met Yao, was working on pushing for accessibility and some of the products that we were working with at Meta. I gave a presentation back on October the 4th about the, um, oh, my hands aren't working today, about emerging technologies, and that includes VR. VR is on the rise and it's gonna continue. It's still kind of a niche small market, but it's not going to be forever. AR is really my biggest passion because of things like captioning glasses that can help me access the world around me. But being here today is I wanna make sure that you all see captions as an accessibility tool for deaf people. I fight for it often because it's accessibility is typically deprioritized. It's not what's on top of mind for people that are developing products. I don't know how many of you have seen a deaf person before. Um, and then when you th think about technology, if you haven't seen a deaf person, you're probably not considering how you make that technology accessible for them. I can count on one hand, the number of um, games and things like that that I've used in the XR space that have been uh, captioned or accessible. So I'm trying to encourage more people to do that so that more and more people can get passionate about it and then they bring that back to their teams and the people they work with to include in their work. One of the biggest things that I noticed my four years of uh, testing is that people don't understand that the placement of captions is important, but then there's also the need for those captions to be modified. You know, you may have a deaf person who also has low vision. You may have a deaf person who um, needs reduced colors because they're overstimulated by the other things. I prefer yellow and black. I see yellow better than I see blue, for example. So having an option for them to be able to select the colors is important. Maybe you have a person who's colorblind and so they don't see uh, the full rainbow spectrum. 
We may have a person that's neurodivergent. So those all are things that have to be included. Just because you put captions there doesn't mean that it's accessible. They have to have options and they have to be easily accessed. Something very simple to get to and turn on. If you're not able to even find the place to turn on captions, they're not gonna be patient and try. I'm, I'm the same way. I just give up and drop it and say the technology wasn't made for me. I'm uh, patient when it's something I'm, I really care about, but if they don't know what your product is yet, they may not invest the time and to be able to figure out how to turn on those captions. Additionally, um, wanting to emphasize that it's so common for people to design something and get to the end and then think it needs to be accessible and try to go back and fix it. And it's so hard to do that if you just think about it from the beginning of the process that you're going to get better results. If it's you know earlier in school or training, people who are exposed to it, um, there seems to be more exposure to it now. So people that are just getting started in their careers are thinking about those things. But you know, focusing on um, people often focus on people with vision loss or mobility disabilities, but things like deafness are later in the process. So it's hard work to do to make things accessible, but it's also important that if you do it from the beginning, it's not gonna be as hard. My accessibility, or my passion is to make sure that there's accessibility out in all of the world. I can't talk in the world, um, you know, like Horizon World, for example, Meta has Horizon World. Ha I can't speak back to someone. Um, so having some option to be able to like, you know, pick from a, few pre-selected phrases or, you know, key sentences or something, or even um, there's like a VR webinar where people can, um, are in the like virtual meeting room, being able to see what everybody's saying, that's not really accessible to me. So thinking through the process from beginning to end of how the user experience is going to be is important. There's the three doff and six doff worlds. So if you're seated, you know, you have a little bit less of an issue because it's you've got this limited space from your peripherals forward. But six doff, you know, it can be above your head, it could be behind you, it could be below your feet, you never know. So you've got to really think through that complete immersive point and make sure that you indicate in some way, oh, these captions or this speaking is over there with an arrow to the right or something indicating that it's behind you. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but it does have to include what's happening in the world for the people to be able to understand that. You know, again, even in an elevator, you know, if somebody is behind me talking, I would have no idea. But if I've got caption glasses on like AR and you know, the captions start showing up, I then can turn around and look at the person behind me. So those are the kind of things, you know, real world and virtual world kind of collide and then the approaches can um, work together. Um, I have, um, you know, I get people thinking all the time that, you know, I, they're not talking to me, but if there's something right here, you know, recognizing that, um, then, maybe I can um, pick up on, on what it is they're trying to communicate, or at least that somebody is communicating. Um, I don't think I have much time left, uh, but <laughs> it's very important to make sure that there is it's built in at the system level. And I know there will be lots of discussions later and, and you know, Yao and Lily will talk about those things, but having captions there, having them visually accessible games and producers for games or something I um, struggle with. Uh, Vader Immortal is a game and the captions are cool and great, but they didn't consider a deaf person or how people would actually use them. The captions actually go through the character's bodies. So then there's a lot of, you know, you, you, can't, you can't read it because the person's body has walked through it or they move backward. And so you're not able to actually fully play the game because they're not headlocked and you can't change the colors, the contrast or anything. It's all set the way that it is. And so if it's black text or I think it's blue text and then the person that like walked through one of the examples was wearing blue. So the fact that it was there, you couldn't see what the person was actually saying because the captions were the same color of the clothing. 
So having the functionality there, not having 15 steps, got to go to a menu and go to this one and go to that one and go to that one and go to that one. Just having it there and ready so that you can get the captions on and you can get back to the same place you started instead of having to come out of the game and going into those menus and then going back again. Also, some headsets have limited pixels, so it's hard to read the captions. So you want to make sure you're using the right background or adjustable. Maybe I can see it, but another person is having a hard time with seeing that. There are so many things to talk about. I'm looking forward to the discussion and having some more community involvement uh, for all of those things. I'm looking forward to that part. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up all the time, but I'm looking forward to seeing what Lily and Yao are going to say, but then also what the community can, can discuss as well. And I'm just reviewing my notes to make sure there isn't something else. Um, automated captioning technology. And I want to say that, so please test for accuracy. Don't depend on automated captioning. Just because it's there doesn't mean that it's good enough. Check the accuracy. Their quality of captions, obviously you can't fix the quality of those auto-generated captions, but, and we can only do the best we can, but we do need to check for the accuracy there before we assume that that's going to be an equivalent use of somebody's access to that product. So, you know, we, AI is there, but we still need people to help, you know, train those AI models and things like that so that they can be corrected in the context of XR and even AR, AR having the microphones, you know, having um, right now consumer uh, AR glasses don't have, the microphones are really pretty terrible. So. Thinking through like the product, and I can talk on and on, but I'd like to, to give it over to Yao. I'm really excited to see what Yao has to say about the topic and then Lily as well, and then engaging with the community. Awesome, thanks so much, Brendan. Um, yeah, I'm happy here to, to turn it over to Yao Ding. Yao is the Accessibility Research Lead at Meta. Uh, he leads user research at Meta's central accessibility team focused on understanding users with disabilities to enhance accessible, equitable experiences. Um, so, Yao, you've got uh, 10 minutes here. Go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. I have a few slides to speak to. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, it's a okay title page. Gotcha. Uh, yep, we can see your screen. Okay, uh, awesome. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. Uh, thanks, Piers, for just organizing this uh, community discussion. Uh, so we have this amazing platform to discuss an important topic, um, captioning in VR. Um, it's amazing because it's not you know, a place to assert you know, what should be done, but rather to open the floor uh, for meaningful dialogue uh, within the community. Um, and thanks, Brandon, for sharing your uh, experiences. Uh, I do really enjoy the time where and Meta, we uh, successfully you know, pushed for forward a couple accessibility features to be implemented. Uh, we're such a staunch advocate. I do really appreciate that. Um, so today, uh, I would like to share uh, uh, a, a set of kind of design considerations uh, for closed captioning in VR. Uh, these considerations are distilled from user research uh, is you know, not intended to be you know, canonical design principles and you know, by no means a comprehensive set of uh, things we should think about in designing captioning in VR. Um, so uh, I would like to hear uh, your feedback, your input, uh, how you think about these uh, considerations. And some of these were already uh, mentioned by uh, Brendan and we can continue the discussion later after Lily's presentation. Um, and you may find out that uh, some of the considerations you know, apply in 2D and some bring you know, unique questions for 3D design. So let's dive into our uh, first consideration, uh, synchronized captions. Uh, so it's crucial that uh, the captions in VR are perfectly in sync with speech, uh, with the audio. Um, the synchronization is key to feeling uh, connected to the content and the conversation. Uh, lagging or you know, leading captions can be distracting and disrupt the natural rhythm of the communi uh, communication, especially in VR. 
when it's compared to in-person uh, conversations. Um, and then uh, accuracy, uh, Brendan just mentioned that, uh, you know, real-time voice-to-text captioning is, you know, vital, the, the, the accuracy. So it provides a seamless line of communication. Um, and one of the challenges that, that you know, some closed captioning you know, algorithms or systems can have difficulty recognizing people with various, you know, uh, accent or with speech uh, disabilities. Uh, flexibility. So uh, it's essential that we offer the uh, flexibility for customization. Um, this means, you know, allowing uh, many adjustments, for example, in color, in text size, in backgrounds, uh, to create, you know, legible setup. And one of the challenges is that there, are you know, low res resolution, you know, VR displays making the text of captions hard to read. Um, and also, uh, people need the ability to adjust the things like the position of uh, captions. I believe it's a really a unique challenge uh, and consideration in 3D uh, captioning design. For example, do we have you know, fixed position versus you know, caption bubbles attached to people in VR? Uh, and also the speed of uh, captions. Uh, do we wanna have captions displayed at a fixed rate, a fixed pace or versus you know, more in the real time, sometimes the slow and sometimes can can go uh, really fast. Um, the fourth one is uh, completeness. Uh, captions should capture, you know, not just a conversational dialogue, but also um, uh, include, you know, descriptors of audio, like uh, you know, crowd noises and sound effects. Um, these descriptions will pull users deeper into the VR, you know, helping people capture the visceral feel in a live event. Um, and then attribution uh, is crucial in VR to have clear attribution for each line of text in, uh, especially in complex environments. Um, and I believe we'll be talking about like some uh, solutions like you know, positioning uh, the captions using uh, distinct colors, you know, naming speakers. Um, these are all the solutions that can enhance the ability for people to follow conversations in really dynamic settings, like in social settings or gaming uh, settings where they are uh, just very intense and uh, a large number of uh, speakers at the same time. And um, the positioning uh, of uh, captions, uh, this is kind of a really important consideration because there's more to speech than just words. Um, placing captions close to people, um, sometimes you know near their mouths, which aids lip reading. Um, and also ensures, you know, kind of better view of the action and nonverbal communications. You know, people do prefer to have really easy way to connect uh, actions in VR and nonverbal communications. Um, and in research, we found, you know, overwhelming support for, you know, caption bubbles adjacent to uh, the avatars in VR. Uh, and when the captions are near the actions, you know, users can better pick up those you know, nonverbal cues. Okay, so again, uh, these are you know, some of the uh, considerations we can discuss further. Uh, and uh, please come in with more considerations I'm missing here. Uh, and also I would like to hear you know, uh, deeper insights and discussions into each of them. And this is kind of the last part of my uh, preso. Uh, since 
you know, there are just so many open questions in this topic. Um, and I hope we can get some uh, airtime for some of the questions, uh, which are kind of critical to our product teams. And I believe some are also the really top concerns for our users. Uh, so for example, like how might we design for trust when it comes to privacy in auto captioning, um, especially with the use of AI and voice recognition um, for real time, you know, auto captioning, where are the ethical and the privacy concerns you know, people have and how to design for trust. Um, the second question is, uh, what you know, closed captioning designs might cause nausea uh, uh, and how to minimize nausea uh, and how to design you know, context rich uh, live captions in VR environments like in you know, game settings where, for example, there are 20 people in the room. How do we wanna design such an experience that reduced you know, cognitive overload, overload and also for people to uh, easy to follow the people or the conversations they would like to follow. Um, and number four, uh, what's an you know MVP like for you know closed captions in VR? You know, if a product team can only launch you know one design option at a time. Um, and last question: What are some examples of cur curb cut effect of closed captions in VR? I think in two D. Design, you know, closed close caption is kind of the perfect example of curb cut effects. It's not only benefiting you know deaf and hard of hearing community, but also you know the non-disabled uh, users. And this kind of widely used, even probably more non-disabled users are using closed captions in uh, mobile and web environments. Um, do this, you know, curb cut effect translate to three D, or they are less or more such effect in 3D? Uh, this is also a question uh, we would like to answer. Okay, so here's a wrap for my part and I will hand it back to Dylan. Awesome, great, thanks y'all. Um, next, I am excited to introduce Lily Bond, SVP of Marketing with 3Play Media. Uh, Three Play Media is a media accessibility platform uh, providing audio description, subtitling services, and closed captioning for television, video content, uh, and more. Uh, and also special thanks to Three Play for sponsoring the captions for today's discussion. Um, I also see the questions coming through in the comments, and please keep them coming. We will certainly address those momentarily. Uh, but for now, to continue the, the presentations, I'd like to pass it off next to Lily. Uh, Lily, please take it away. Thanks. Uh, great to be here. Um, nice to see everyone uh, interested in this topic. I uh, want to start by saying that I am not an XR expert, but I am a captioning expert. I've been with 3Play Media, which is a you know enterprise closed captioning company for 10 years. Um, and I think it's really critical that captioning experts, XR experts, and the deaf the deaf and hard of hearing community really come together to develop these standards and best practices, because all three of those perspectives are really critical to make sure that this is a successful outcome. Um, so I, I do think I, you know, I appreciate that that kind of Brendan was talking about ASR and, and the challenges of ASR, obviously, in XR environments, there are a lot of, uh, you know, mixed audio quality, multiple speakers, background noise, all of those make ASR more and more challenging. Um, at 3Play, we do provide ASR as, as a solution, um, both live and recorded, but we primarily focus on really high quality human in the loop captioning. So using kind of a combination of, of ASR and humans to create a really high quality accurate output. So I'm gonna be talking mostly about that process, but all of the same concepts apply when you're talking about ASR. You just have to kind of re realize that the accuracy um, you know, degrades rapidly with all of those external factors. So I thought um, I could talk a little bit about how captioning vendors work. Um, for example, if you wanted to go to a vendor and caption an XR experience, what would that look like? Um, and then some of the gaps 
between what it would take um, from kind of how captioning vendors work today to what is really necessary to support XR in the future. Um, so I think the first question is, uh, you know, there are live XR environments, there are recorded XR environments, and there are hybrid environments. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on recorded because I think it's a little bit easier to conceptualize. Um, the same core requirements ex exist for live, just harder. Um, so I think recorded is where the kind of early adoption of, of captioning will be easiest. When a captioning vendor uh, starts working with a customer, um, the first thing that you need is you, you need access to audio. So you need to be able to listen to the media um, and visuals are really critically helpful with that. Um, and good audio is also very helpful. Um, today, we and most other scaled captioning providers accept you know, dozens and dozens of different types of audio and video files um, and can ingest from all sorts of different workflows. Um, there's direct upload, there's FTP integrations, APIs. So I think like one of the things to figure out is what is the right kind of uh, like seamless workflow to enable kind of scaled captioning um, with XR. Uh, then once you can listen to the audio, you can do the captioning. So at, at 3Play, we use ASR first. So that enables us to time code every single word in the audio track, um, not just every second, which uh, you can't really, or every, every caption frame, um, but every single word. Um, so that really enables flawless timing, which is one of the kind of critical components of accuracy. Um, from there, we have humans that go through and they edit that ASR um, and then a third QA step to make sure that it's it's flawless. Um, and then we output something. So we output a caption file. Um, there are over 50 different output formats and caption formats. Um, and included in those formats are the text, the time codes, um, and the position data. So. Um, I do want to note that not all caption formats support positioning and styling data. For example, a YouTube video would take an SRT or WebVTT file. Um, that's a pretty standard web format. Those do not support caption positioning data. Um, you need a much more complex caption uh, format that, to support that. Um, so if you imagine there's already limitations in 2D video with caption formats, that is going to be um, a much bigger problem with XR. Um, and then things like, uh, like color, font, size, all those really critical experiential things that, that Brendan was mentioning um, is actually usually controlled in the video player, not in the caption uh, format. Um, so uh, that enables the user to control those settings themselves versus having it hard coded into the caption format. Um, and you know, the text, the timing, the position, those are all different types of metadata. Um, you can certainly associate other types of metadata um, with a caption track. Um, certainly things, there's opportunities in the future for things like, um, you know, embedding links or descriptive text or, um, you know, other experiential cues in the metadata of a caption track. Um, so that's what the process looks like today if you were to come to a captioning vendor. Um, and I think that there are a couple of really big gaps from what is possible today um, to what we need to do to support XR. The biggest gap is this positioning data. Um, so today, standard caption formats only support 2D position data, like up, down, left, right. Um, there is no caption format that supports 3D positioning data today. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to develop a caption format standard um, that supports 3D positioning um, in order for XR captioning to be supported at scale. Um, the way around that is to encode captionings direct caption direct captions directly into the experience. Um, that has some limitations to it for sure. Um, so I think this is just a huge gap that needs to be supported. The other is uh, clear standards. So yeah, I was really starting to talk about some of these, but there are extremely precise captioning standards um, for 2D recorded video um, and for live video. Um, 
for example, around positioning, grammar, punctuation, how to caption sound effects. Um, for example, the FCC has um, very clear captioning standards. If captions would block text in the lower third, you have to move the captions to a different location on screen. Um, and we need to decide what those best practices are for determining the proper location of captions, how to caption sound effects when they're happening in different places on screen. Um, what happens if someone speaks behind you? Where do those captions go? Um, what happens you know, if there are multiple speakers depending on the direction you're facing? Um, and then we need to really align those best practices with the development of this caption format. Um, to support the necessary metadata to really evolve in this experience. Um, there are several other kind of open questions that like we as a captioning vendor are thinking about um, when we're looking at the development of immersive captions. Um, the number one question I have is like today, all captioning vendors work by ingesting a media file of some sort. Um, what is possible in terms of XR production teams like giving a captioning company a media asset? Um, I think even that basic um, starting point is going to be really hard and something that we need to figure out. Um, can XR accept a caption file? Um, do we have to go the, the encoding route? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why XR experts and captioning experts really need to work together on this. It doesn't work to solve one problem and not the other. Um, and so ultimately this collaboration between the deaf community, understanding kind of the preferences, the technical specifications around um, the best place to put location, the best way to visualize those captions, um, the XR community and really understanding the technical specifications of like 3D geographical location data. Um, and then the, the captioning uh, community and kind of the technical specs and limitations of current caption formats and styling um, will really help us determine you know, standards which we desperately need for where captions should be located, how they can be displayed there, um, and then what those gaps are. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to do here. And I think it really requires this collaboration between these three communities to do it well. Um, and I'm excited that we're starting to have those conversations. Um, so that is what I have. I'm um, looking forward to the questions and uh, feedback from the community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, yeah, it, 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 there's is definitely a huge gap there. I mean, even thinking about like, what files do you send over and send back? That's a <laughs> big question with a not obvious answer. Um, so I think at this point, uh, this is a, a community discussion. Um, I would love to um, make sure that we, we give the community here a chance to chat. Uh, so I think the process that we'll be using for this is if you can um, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, we'll call on you. Um, we will spotlight your screen so that you will show up on uh, our recording very clearly. Um, and then please just go ahead and once you're spotlighted uh, so that you know, the interpreters everybody can see you as well, um, go ahead and introduce yourself and um, yeah, we can we can have a discussion. So I think the first one I see here is uh, Mary Vans. So we'll just go ahead and spotlight you. And uh, great, take it away. Hi, yes, my name is Marie Vans. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Systems Engineering at Colorado State University. And my question is, or my, 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 it's a question and also information, if you don't know, um, do people here know of the robust community of deaf uh, folks and people who can't speak in VR chat called um, the Experimental Sign Language World and Mr. Dummy LNL? Um, if you don't know about this community, um, one of the things they have is somebody has developed a captioning, basically it's thought bubbles over their head that um, they can communicate. So when the avatars are in world, they are socializing and they have these thought bubbles that appear above their heads. Now, this is a big deal because as a person who's been in just about all the social virtual reality worlds out there, um, Text in VR, as we have said, 
is 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 a functionality that's sort of an afterthought in in these spaces. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to um, to everybody's attention because I because the experiences that I've seen it's 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 something that um, that seems to overcome that problem. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. That's really good to know. Uh, is there a, a website or any place that um, people could learn more about that? Because I, I, I'd certainly be curious to find out. It's just VR chat. If you've ever been in VR chat um, and you look for, I'll put it in the text. It's a, uh, it's the experimental sign language um, world and Mr. Dummy underscore NL. So if you go in and uh, you search for those worlds. You can you can go in there. Um, you can create an instance for just you and friends, or you can go to the public instance, and there you'll probably meet a lot of people. Great. So by joining this world, do you automatically it, everybody that joins it has this kind of captioning functionality? No, they don't. No. Just oh, okay. you. You have to. You. So basically, it's it's. It's something that you can get from the community if you if you join the 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 community itself. So the way I would the way I would do it is how how I did it actually is I found somebody who knew who knew about it. I went in there, I met people, um, and asked them about getting the module that you need to basically put into your instance of VR chat um, to use it. Gotcha. And and I can also, you know, people, I'll put my email in here too. If people are interested in, I can connect you with somebody there who knows uh, who knows about it. Yeah, that that would be excellent. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. And I see we have Lucas Soto here uh raising hand. And we spotlight Lucas. Okay, I will be communicating in sign language. So I wanted to make sure the interpreter can see me. This discussion really, it gives me goosebumps to think about how far we've come, but to think about managing all of our needs. I know that there was some discussion from Brendan about the need for captioning and how we can really make an impact on these large companies to apply captioning in the design period and to really justify the tremendous need for captioning in accessibility. And I don't know if there is a group established that will allow us to be able to do that action, to be able to come forward to large companies or how we would proceed with that. Is anyone want to I, respond to that? I'm oh. just looking for a response from someone. Well, it's great to see a deaf person joining us today. So I'm I'm glad you're here. Cool to see you. Um, it is going to obviously require a great deal of advocacy because percentage-wise, deaf people are considered a very small population amongst the whole. And so I know there are a number of individuals who are very eager to get involved in this process and advocate for captioning. Uh, Google is a company that does have deaf people who are advocating for that amongst their platform. There are others as well, but there are times sometimes that it requires legal action, a lawsuit in order to respond to the disregard that we've seen from companies in the past. We would rather go about this with this open community discussion and identifying who those leaders are in this fight, as it were. Um, it takes a number of people to move mountains. Um, it, it can't be a single individual. And when I was at Meta, I made as much change as I was able to as a single individual. But I know that that's something that will rely on many of us joining together. Other thoughts or comments? And Lucas is saying, if I could respond or just a comment to that, 
I am not deaf, but I use sign language. So just so you know, I wanted to clarify that I am not a deaf individual. I am wondering if there are any groups that are already organized um, who are doing lobbying work for the proliferation of captioning or whether or not that exists. Uh, well, are you talking about in general or are you talking about XR? No, for XR, um, I, I think this group, I think this group that XR access and I think the XR association, I think being part of this group is key. And Lucas has said, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'll ask Pierce, this is Dylan. Um, let me get the spotlights working here. Uh, you know, you're, you're uh, the, the ones that are based out of Washington, D.C. Do you know of there's a lot of uh, you know, interest on that side? I know we, we've had um, the FCC take, certainly take an interest uh, you know, in our last symposium, um, but I, I'm curious if you have any other insights there. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm certainly familiar with a couple of other advocacy groups which are pushing, um, uh, uh, particularly there's there's a great blind organization, the American Federation for the Blind, which is doing a lot of great work. As far as closed captioning specifically goes, I unfortunately am not aware of a group that's doing a lot of push on the advocacy side. Um, I did also have kind of a general question for the community too. It was a, a kind of a topic brought up um, in, uh, um, in Brenda's presentation and Lily's presentation, there was a question in the chat, so it might be worth to kind of bubble up here. Um, what are, uh, has anyone seen a game um, or developed a game that exemplifies kind of best practices for closed captioning? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I know that there's some developers in, in, in the uh, um, uh, discussion today. Uh, but are there any other other titles which do just a, a stellar job? And if so, did those games, if you're aware, bring in um, uh, deaf people in the early stages of the development? Yeah, uh, this is Dylan. I know we we often do praise uh, Alchemy Labs for for doing this. I know they've done. I definitely have implemented uh, captions in. Uh, I think their, you know, job simulator, vacation simulator, Cosmonius High. Um, I've certainly heard enough to know that that those aren't perfect captions by any means, but I know they've they've certainly at least been been kind of pushing the envelope there. Um, I also know that that um, the uh, Apple and their their Vision Pro they put out an accessibility video that did seem to feature um, captions at the system level that people could hook into. Um, I won't put Yao on the spot to ask if Meta has done anything similar, because I'm sure it would be, be NDA until it releases. Um, but I, I would certainly hope that we'd see, um, you know, leadership like that in terms of uh, making it not just on the, the onus of the individual, um, uh, uh, you know, content creator, but something that is facilitated by the platform, uh, I'm sure is something we'd, we'd love to see. Um, does anybody else have suggestions of XR works that that currently have, you know, good captions that we can learn from? So I'd I'd certainly be love to to know as well. Um, people can feel free to to put that in the chat as we as we think of them. I think. Um, I know we had some other questions here from chat. Uh, let's see, coming back up. So don't skip everybody. Um, so I want to highlight an issue concerning caption generation and flexibility. It'd be a challenge to maintain, uh, this is from uh, Dio Gratius Shidende, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It can be a challenge to maintain the UI and UX when users are allowed to adjust the font size of captions for accessibility person uh, purposes in XR. This can lead to distortions and breakage on the UI. For I'm seeking recommendations for maintaining the UI, especially in the context of real-time caption generation in the XR environment. Um, so that's a great question. I think we've talked about having customizable captions, but that's very important to consider the context of what's going on in the environment, right? Um, you know, if you increase your caption so large that it's blocking out key UI elements, uh, that could be tricky. Um, does anybody have suggestions? I don't, I don't know if there's any kind of front end, you know, UI designers uh, in the audience that maybe like to speak to that, but um, that, that could be a, a great thing to discuss here today. 
I can uh, jump in with a little bit of feedback on how this works in the recorded space, because I think that it um, extends certainly to, to XR. Um, so the FCC actually has um, caption user control requirements um, for video players and streaming platforms. Um, and they have viewed that as um, the priority over the UI. So giving the person who requires the captioning the control over their experience, regardless of the UI impact is kind of the priority that the FCC has set. Um, and I think a lot of people in the community um, agree with that. I'm certainly, you know, curious if there's there's other feedback there. I would expect the same kind of goals to extend to XR um, if standards are developed in that space. Gotcha. And Lily, well, we we have you spotlighted here. I was going to ask as well. Um, we talked talked about there not being a kind of captions format that integrates 3D data. Um, do you know who set the format for the captions and 2D data and you know current kind of standards there? And I'm sure the answer is many people and it's it's complicated, but I, I'm just thinking if we were to bring in organizations and reach out and say like, hey, we need to update these standards or create a new one, uh, what organizations do you think would be good people to include in that conversation? Yeah, so I think um so the kind of most complex caption format um, and kind of like series of caption formats or SMPD time text formats. Um, those are uh, the most uh, advanced in terms of supporting things like, like placement. Um, and uh, SMPD, which I think is the Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers, um, was the group that developed that standard. There have been multiple other groups. Um, certainly, the W3C has been involved in some standard creation. Um, and also, a lot of captioning vendors. Um, like, we have an R&D team internally that creates custom caption formats for different types of environments. Um, so a lot of those experts are actually in captioning companies themselves. Um, but uh, SMPD definitely has been interesting. And then um, CTA also is, is a group that has been involved in some standard creation. Awesome. Good to know. We'll, we'll definitely uh, have to loop them in on the next one of these. <laughs> um, great. Let's see. What other questions we have in the chat? Or anybody else is welcome to uh, there was raise their hand? There was another great question here in the chat asked by um, Lucas and was also uh, introduced in, in, in the presentations earlier. Uh, uh, currently, are there any plugins or embedded tools within a game creation software that allow for easy creation and manipulation of closed captioning? So we're talking about APIs that you can bring into Unity or Unreal. Um, are, is there uh, guidance from anybody in the community on which APIs are um, kind of meet that criteria, easy creation and manipulation of closed captioning. Great question for the community. I'll, I'll take this moment to to plug. We have, um, I think, Savio Menifer here in the chat, who's one of our, our XR open source fellows, uh, who created a, an, an open source chirp captions uh, plugin for Unity for doing kind of pre uh, pre recorded captions. Um, so, Savio or somebody should definitely definitely post that because I think that's a, a great resource for folks here. Um, but yeah, I would, would love to hear, uh, as you said, from folks who know about the the best tools for this. Also, if somebody thinks of one afterwards, feel free to um, reach out to Dylan or myself, and we can um, spread that information out. Yeah, and I'll also note we have uh, an XR Access Slack, and within that Slack, a captions channel. Um, so I'll I'll share the link to our Slack and chat here. Um, and if folks uh, want to to continue this conversation um, and kind of share resources there, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be posting our um, uh, the outcomes from this, as well as how to get to the the XR Access newsletter. Um, but that's a, a great place to to join the the extra access community if you care about this because this is this is our bread and butter for sure. 
Well, I'd love to hear from folks in the, the community that have been uh, kind of silent thus far. Is there anybody that wants to uh, raise their hand, talk about um, challenges that you've faced in access to captions or your developer, designer challenges you faced in trying to, to implement captions? Don't be shy now. <laughs> Here we go, we have uh, Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say it's the first time I've joined the community and um, it's been really, low. I've been sitting in the background making loads of notes, so I've been quite quiet. Um, so my name's Michael Swift, I'm based uh, at Coventry University uh, over in the UK. Um, I, uh, I'm a media producer, so for all our online content, I'm one of a team of media producers, um, loan designers, uh, and things like that. Um, and we work really hard currently. Everything we do is, uh, the majority of content is is pre-recorded video and audio. So um, everything that we've been hearing um, from Lily, thank you, uh, it's chiming really, really closely with, with the work that we do. I haven't got a lot to, to add. I just wanted to say thank you at this point um, because certainly in VR it's and, and, and the XR space, it's something that we're investigating a lot. Um, the university uh, is kind of moving into that space uh, increasingly, but we are rapidly finding all these these barriers across uh, all the accessibility needs um, when it comes to to the immersive space. Um, so um, I'm talking myself into a corner here. <laughs> uh, Michael, I'd, no love to ask, I'd love um, to ask you a question while you're spotlighted here, if that's OK. Uh, what would you say um, that you, you guys are finding are the biggest needs right now in the accessibility space? Um, for um, maybe closed captioning, and if there are others too, I think we'd love to hear about them. Thank you. And that's exactly why I put my hand up. So um, it's it's a really big resource drain, you know, as, as has been mentioned by everyone else. I think that um, accuracy is a, is a big problem. I, I see a lot of video content out there uh, and assuming this is sort of a, a, a similar issue that we'll, we'll find in the VR space and the XR space going forward, that it's this auto generation. And, and that's it, we've done it. Auto generated, we've ticked the box. And just as far as the users are concerned, that's tough. Um, but to get that right, um, it's, a really, it's a really big resource uh, and intensive time consuming thing. Um, we have a lot of discussions around how much AI will start to solve that for us. Um, but it's it's really not there yet. So so those are the challenges for us. I think guessing it getting it right, getting a good user experience. We consider um, that the captioned. We haven't got the data on this, but but we're pretty confident that the captions and the transcripts that we that we put out with all our media content are not only used by kind of hearing impaired um, users and students, but also by people who have have English as a second language or third language um, where accent becomes a problem um, potentially for revision aids and things like that so actually there's a much bigger we see a much bigger impact of, of having good accessibility and good human-centered design at, at the outset um, rather than just bolting it on but yeah for sure it's 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 just not there and it's a big resource drain um, I think for any organization trying to get it right um uh the promising thing though, and i think it was already mentioned is kind of um apis and plugins that individual users can start to integrate and we we're starting to see that more um i think on kind of overlays for for web um where people are able to adapt their their color contrast and things like that and i'm quite excited to keep seeing where those adaptations might be available because i sort of feel a little bit like possibly those user focused um, tools are going to get developed faster than the, the bigger um, uh, organizational institution kind of level um, provision. Uh, it feels like, yeah, kind of you, you, user, 
user devices are probably going to come through faster and quicker. So I'm quite excited to see more of those. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you. I've waffled enough. <laughs> Um, and just say thank you for um, for being part of this. It's it's really exciting to see and hear and know that there are people out there and people that we can start discussing more with. Uh, and I'm kind of very excited that anything that we start to discover more and can, to be able to share with the group. Of course, uh, thank you, absolutely. Michael. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, one thing I'd I'd love to to propose to the group here is just a little thought experiment. Um, this is something we've been you know discussing over at the the. Um, uh, W3C Immersive Captions Community Group, um, but we've been talking about the difference between uh, kind of pre-recorded captions uh, and live captions. Um, so, for example, if we were at a social VR event, right, what's the best way to do captions there, especially when it comes to, for example, uh, you know, privacy, when it comes to having everybody in the room talking all at once. Um, so, I would, I would love to understand from folks, like, if you could just you know wave a magic wand or, or just do some brainstorming with me here and, and think about um what would captions look like in a you know let's say you're at a, a vr party right what is what is your ideal captioning experience like and I'd, I'd love to to hear from the people in this room uh what you might imagine and um, again feel free to, to raise your hand or type into the chat um yeah love to hear from you people a second to think that one over. I know one interesting aspect for me is the idea of speech bubbles. Um, as we were talking about earlier in, in VR chat, I think the main challenge with a speech bubble is that if you're not already looking at the person, you might not even know that the speech bubble is there, right? Um, and so one of the things we, we talked about at the Immersive Captions group was uh, basically, should captions be prioritizing being near the person that's speaking them? Um, should they prioritize being on screen or should they prioritize being kind of nice and central? Uh, because it's possible if two people over here and here are having a, a conversation that you're like breaking your neck, trying to look back and forth to read the captions. Um, but if everybody's captions just kind of pile up in the center of your screen, um, then it can be very different. It's easy to read, but it's difficult to tell whose is whose and where is the speaker um, and like how far away does do you get those captions kind of coming to you from. Um, and certainly this is something that I think uh, is going to need to, in some respects, be modular, right? We'll need to be able to adjust um, how central you want things and how we we tag people or maybe interactive even where you select, it's all central, but you select somebody and then it, you know, just sends a streamer over to the person that's talking. Um, lots of potential ways to do that, but uh, I, that maybe will, will kind of spark, spark the conversation here. I see two people with hands raised. Uh, I think Jesse, uh, raise your hand first. So we'll we'll put Jesse on the on the stand here. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that as you were talking. You kind of beat me to uh, a couple of my ideas that I was thinking about because I know when we were talking about in some of our XR access meetings a while back, when we were talking in the development group, um, I, I would see it as kind of like offering the user a lot of choice in that area. So like if I was in, let's say a classroom environment or a party, I could see there being maybe options for like, are there people that are designated in this room to be like a head, uh, like a, you know, think about like in, in Zoom or something, you have administrators or moderators. So you have these core people that you might always sort of want to pay attention to at some point but then you could say well i also have my direct you know friends that i came to this party with i want to keep an i want to know what they're saying but also maybe having like a, like you said kind of a um a distance setting that you could do to say, you know, uh, in, in the perimeter, maybe I'd like to know, you know, a couple of 
a couple of feet away or a few feet away so you're not overwhelmed by captions or bubbles or things like that but you can kind of specify the distance but then you could also um, designate like key people in the room that everyone should pay attention to or key people that you would want to pay attention to that just a couple ideas that i was thinking gotcha yeah i think in terms of how we want to be able to customize it definitely um being able to, to prioritize certain people uh i know one thing that, that came up was the cocktail party effect which is that uh, you can be chatting with people, you know, in a party, and if your name is spoken, and I, I don't know if this is something that that deaf people experience, but as a hearing person, if your name is spoken, you will hear it from like across a crowded room and be like, "What? Who's who's talking about? My ears are burning." <laughs> uh, so that is definitely something that that is an interesting question. Do we replicate that if somebody says your name or maybe something you're very interested in? Does it like flash the caption at you? Um, Awesome. I think we had Lucas and then Brendan. Okay, as I picture it, and I am involved in a number of different spaces and often engage with other players. And what I imagine is as you approach someone and you are communicating with them directly, I would love to see a speech bubble. And I love that idea because it's directly related to the person with whom I'm interacting. However, if there are a number of people contributing to the interaction, then I see a long string of captions and it's difficult to keep track of who is saying what. So just an idea I had is, maybe speech bubbles for direct interaction being highlighted and then small appearance of bubbles as interaction is account is happening in the environment around me therefore the direct interaction is clear and then as i look away from that person that bubble may close and then i can look towards other speech bubbles i see in the environment and can then zoom in basically move into where I'm able to interact with them more directly. So just kind of an idea I've played with visually. So it's Brendan. Uh, yes, I wanted to comment on something we talked about a few minutes ago. That was a great suggestion, by the way, Lucas. I love to see, you can see how much I love gaming. That's, it is my tool. I keep the Xbox and all of my gaming um, equipment around me. I'm surrounded by it constantly. And when I join a game or I attend an event, I wish I had like a friends list where the captioning for those people would be highlighted. Um, and that the person could identify themselves as the person who is speaking, kind of like in, in real life, you might see a ball passed around to indicate who's speaking. So I wonder about those speech bubbles following the speakers, but if there would be some indication in a, the basic captioning space that would allow me or direct my attention so that I am not so overwhelmed and there's not so much interaction that it completely covers the screen because obviously in a VR world it can get overwhelming but if there was a maybe an arrow or some indication to direct my attention based on calling my name um or some tool that would allow me to identify haptics. where I want to direct my attention using haptics. So I that is why I rely on this device, because I know that the haptics will kind of guide me in my navigating the experience. I have a cochlear implant, so there are sensitivity settings that could be adjusted, perhaps, so I could focus on a particular space and 
to imagine what it would be like depend, based on the distance that person stands from you in the world so that it's not overwhelming. It's not the entire world, but in theory, would I be able to hear someone that far away? And a, some way of measuring that or setting that up via distance to clarify. Uh, yes, Michael. I'm sorry, I'll turn it back over. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the idea of the speech bubble uh, and, and the haptics combined. We um, were recently testing a, a metaverse space and had spatial audio uh, coming through some video content playing. Um, and uh, yeah, that kind of directional spatial audio from from other people in the in the space. And so I'm I'm not deaf. I do have hearing aids. So over over life, I've kind of encountered that thing where Yes, I get the cocktail party thing, so I, I hear people, but other times I really genuinely don't. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, kind of when you get, when it, I agree with that issue of overload, uh, cognitive overload, audio overload, just too much going on. And, and so um, I think that opportunity to, to reduce and, and define that direction um, and allow, I think also it needs to be about allowing other users. I mean, in, in a game, I guess we've got one person. If we're thinking about a, a broader multi-user space, perhaps there's also, we need to rem uh, allow other users the opportunity to, to get the attention of uh, a hearing impaired user. You know, some sort of a tap on the arm kind of function of some sort. Um, so it's not necessarily just captions popping up when someone speaks, which means there might be a bit of a lag, but actually a, a way to alert that person. Um, yeah. Uh, definitely great suggestions. Uh, James? Uh, hi, do you, do you have me? Oh, oh, just a sec, I'm adding the spotlight. There we are. Hi. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot of ideas about um, how to kind of prioritize captions depending on the, the context. And I think the common thread here is that what would be great is more focus uh, from the AI space on uh, the human kind of um, mechanics behind attention, cognition, right? So like, for example, the, the cocktail party effect where you hear your name sort of off in the distance and your brain over many thousands of years of evolution, you know, you're kind of trained to zero in on that. Um, and that's something that I don't think is simple to capture from a programming standpoint. Uh, and, you know, if we had a lot more AI that, or a lot more research in AI to kind of replicate the cognitive mechanics of attention, uh, that might go a long way towards um, helping us solve the, the mechanics of how do we display what is most relevant in, in caption form uh, in the XR. Awesome. Yeah, definitely a good point. I think. AI we're, we're seeing kind of come into the picture in a big way, right? Um, in terms of not only just the direction, you know, directly doing uh, speech to text, um, and hopefully we'll see the accuracy of that continue to improve. But you're right, I think there's a lot of ideas in terms of context switching that I think it's gonna be very helpful to have, have AI to help with. Um, I remember, reading a, a study uh, about the set of AR glasses uh, intended to help folks with colorblindness. Um, and it had, you know, one mode to uh, tell you when meat was, you know, pink, raw versus rare versus done. Uh, it had another mode that would tell you, you know, if you're passing through a crowd of flowers, it would say like, hey, here's something that because of your colorblindness, let's, you know, show the different colors. Um, and like a few other modes, but the, the big issue wasn't that any of these modes individually didn't function well, because they all did, they were all useful kind of in particular situations. Um, but the kept, complaint they kept getting from everybody was like, well, you know, I don't want to have to switch between modes every single time. And sometimes I, mean, I even know I need to switch modes. Um, and so having, I think in a similar way, an AI that can 
detect based on how many people are in the environment, um, how many of those people are your friends, what kind of event it is, whether there's a sp you know one speaker, um, looking at like your behavior in similar events in the past and trying to like capture that and and automate it. Uh, I think having those like AI companions to help manage this in an intelligent way and take the attention of the user off of um, trying to manage their you know captioning software and onto the event itself. Um, I think that's that's definitely going to be big. Um, I see Yao with his hand up. Why don't we have Yao first, and then we'll have uh, Brendan. Yeah, uh, I think I'm hearing a lot of great ideas about the bubble design. And I'm wondering, like, for people, you know, who find kind of the bubbles moving along with the people in VR, kind of uh, uh, experience, you know, nausea, motion sickness, uh, you know, for people who have vestibular issues, like uh, Meryl commented earlier, what would a kind of alternative option like for people who won't be able to use the bubbles? A question to the whole community. And it looks like I, mean, I was responding in, in chat with the focus on motion. Uh, so definitely good reference there. Um, yeah, folks, feel free to, to answer in chat or to raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll pass it to Brendan here. Okay, so I think the colors, thank you for reminding me of that feature. Um, talking about colors, that is something I would like to spend some time talking about because I notice a number of different gaming companies are focusing on uh, different colored indicators that will indicate sound and direction of sound. And it can be very simply uh, shown up as a border on the screen. So I think it's a cool idea to think about a visual view or haptic connection to types of sound. And I also think that there are audio cues that can be connected. And I think it would be cool to have an AI assistant help me so that I wasn't having to go in and change all these settings and adjust all these settings as, as we all just discussed. Uh, I think that there could be several, several levels that we could choose from. Um, and I know that there are times that people are wanting to avoid some of that interaction because they're not sure that they will be able to cover it. Um, and the interpreter missed the reference to audio, audioradar.com previously. So I did want to include that. I've also noticed that there are tools that are available in some systems, but not in all. Um, I think the speech bubbles are a great, a great feature to be able to include, but to be able to have the ability to change out of speech bubbles into a different format if that is more suitable for your particular needs. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I'm also a little aware of time here. Uh, we're approaching up on the half hour. Um, so I, I, I'd like to, to pitch it back over to our um, speakers to see if there are any final comments before we kind of round out the discussion today. So Brendan, uh, Yao or Lily, any, any uh, um, last comments here for the group? Oh, this is just so helpful. I'm, you know, taking many pages of notes here and I would definitely bring this forward to the uh, colleagues who work on captions in VR. Awesome, great. Thanks, thanks, thanks for all, all the input, everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. It's been an extremely helpful conversation and I think a conversation that we really need to continue having um, given all of the gaps that exist and starting to get alignment around um, all of these preferences and, and needs and then working with the right groups to, to implement it. Um, I'm excited to see where it continues to go.
definitely. Great. Well, um, uh, and a big thumbs up from Brendan too. Yes, I just want to thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this, for including deaf people in a discussion about features that will benefit deaf people. And please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, my door is open at all times to be able to participate in these conversations and, and open discussion at any point. I really know that we have a shared goal of making sure that these games and that the virtual world is accessible to everyone, everyone, and whatever we develop is likely to benefit all of us. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brendan. Um, terrific. Uh, Dylan, any other uh, last words here? Yeah, I, I would just uh, first say again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you 3Play for, for sponsoring the, the captions today. Um, thank you to our interpreters who've been doing a wonderful job. Uh, I would encourage everyone, uh, I've posted, I'm posting a few links here in chat. Uh, we have our Slack, um, which is our kind of XR access community where we try to kind of talk about and solve these problems. Um, you can, I, I think hashtag captions is, uh, sorry, the, the captions channel is going to be the one to, to talk about this event at. Um, and I would also put in our GitHub where we have been kind of gathering up um, all of the, the resources that we can to uh, facilitate, you know, accessible content. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Sabio's uh, captions, open source captions, Unity project, and I think a few other related resources. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and, and close it out here, but we'll be posting uh, this, this discussion to YouTube in the coming, coming days. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Perfect. Thank you all.